All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. And if folks join us as we go, um, that's fine. So again, welcome everyone to the first in our series of Fair Trade Month webinars. My name is Kylie, and I'm the Campus and Community Engagement Manager with Fair Trade Campaigns. Today's topic is enrolling campus decision makers, and we will be joined by Aaron Fabris of UCLA Housing and Hospitality Services and Leslie Forrest Mikala of Arizona State University Sustainability Practices. Today's webinar is focused on the topic of enrolling campus decision makers, and we've really found here at Fairtrade Campaigns that there is um, a strong need for collaboration um, among our um, Fairtrade campus campaigns, and collaboration can mean a lot of different things. It can be between students and staff, departments or offices, sustainability and dining, and so we hope that today's webinar will help provide you all, our campus advocates, with some insight tools and tips to bring back to your campus on how to enroll and engage campus decision makers and how to collaborate uh, between stakeholders on campus. So without further ado, um, let me go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Leslie. So Leslie is the program manager for Arizona State University Sustainability Practices. She is coordinating a variety of sustainability projects in this role at Arizona State University's Tempe campus, including an online sustainability literacy program and works on staff and student engagement programs. Leslie holds a Master of Arts in Environmental Studies and a Bachelor of Arts with a double major in Environmental Studies and Psychology from the University of Southern California. Prior to joining Arizona State University, Leslie worked as an air quality planner for the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. She has also held roles in community outreach and environmental conservation at nonprofit organizations and government agencies in the Phoenix area. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Leslie, and I'll also let everyone know that we will have time for Q&A at the end of the um, speaking presentations, and we'll also have a little bit of time um, after Leslie speaks before we hear from Erin. And there is a chat box as well. If you'd like to put your questions in the chat, please do. Well, thank you so much for um, inviting me to be on this call and to talk a little bit about Arizona State University's um, fair trade designation journey. Um, I will be completely transparent in saying that um, I was really involved in kind of the latter half of our journey to be designated. And um, for ASU, this initiative was very, very much student driven um, and student coordinated and, and the students did all of really the hard legwork. And so I just got involved kind of at the end. Um, but I think that it's an example and it's, it's proved to be an example um, for our sustainability department and the other stakeholders that we work with on campus of what can happen um, when we do have really well thought out collaboration between our partners and when we do um, really work with our students and kind of channel their enthusiasm and their knowledge um, to make a really big impact um, on our campuses. So, um, with that, I'm going to just give you a little bit of context about um, ASU and kind of our culture that really helped foster um, and, and made um, the, the jump to be a fair trade university made that an easy win for us. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk you through the process um, and then um, I'll kind of give an update about where we're at now. So for, for right now, you'll have to excuse me, I'm going to brag on ASU a little bit. Um, but I think that this really speaks to um, kind of the culture that existed at ASU, which really helped to make um, signing off uh, our, our president's commitment to um, fair trade an easy um, yes, um, because it fits in with a lot of the other things that we're already working on. Um, ASU had the first school of sustainability in the nation, which was founded in 2006. Um, since then, that's grown tremendously. Um, we offer everything from certificate programs um, to PhDs and, sorry, if you could go back one slide. Sorry about that. Um, we offer everything from certificate programs to PhDs. Um, we're just starting a, a couple new degrees in food system sustainability. And so I do think that fair trade is going to be very instrumental in that. Um, and that'll give us an opportunity on a curriculum level to talk more about fair trade. 
Um, we're gold rated through um, AC STARS, so that's um, a rating system through the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Ed. There's a food sourcing category on the, that uh, rating system for those of you who aren't familiar. And fair trade um, products are um, things that you can get points for. So again, um, how we pitched this to our um, stakeholders and our leadership was this already aligns with things um, that we're already striving and aspiring to do. Um, and so it just makes a lot of sense. And then, um, yes, we're top five in Sierra Magazine School School um, this year's ranking. So we're very proud of that. Um, next slide, please. So this slide just shows um, kind of how sustainability is organized at ASU. Uh, we are a huge, huge campus. Uh, we have over 100,000 students, um, including our online student population, and we have five different campuses within the Phoenix metro area. So um, we're spread out, we're very large, and my department, University Sustainability Practices, only has six full-time staff people. So. Um, all, everything that we do is relying on partnerships and um, making sure that we're coordinating with people um, in a really uh, strategic way and making sure that um, our goals also align with their goals. So um, this diagram just outlines kind of the different partners that work on sustainability at ASU. My department is uh, on the second column to the left, um, University Sustainability Practices. We also have a research institute that focuses on focuses on sustainability. Um, sustainability is built into our facilities and uh, development and management. And then you'll notice that last column, which I ultimately think is the most important column. Um, and that lists all of our partners that work with us on sustainability initiatives. So I would encourage, um, I would encourage you as you're going through kind of your fair trade designation journey, wherever you may be at that, it's to look at your partners across campus and really, um, you might find partnerships or advocates for this in places you might not expect. So dining services is obviously a really obvious choice and um, Aramark, our dining um, service partner has been fantastic. Um, but once we started getting the word out that we wanted to become fair trade designated, our other dining partners who provide catering wanted to get on board or um, our, our bookstore services wanted to get on board as well. And so um, that's kind of helped bolster the movement and um, kind of help spread uh, spread the commitment to fair trade across the university. And so I would say just kind of be thinking about who you might partner with um, and who can help kind of be a champion, um, maybe outside of your food services provider or even outside of your sustainability department. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide really talks about uh, what ASU sustainability goals are. Again, I'm showing this really to, to demonstrate that we have sort of this culture of sustainability um, and that that's very helpful in the fact that we have already this built-in culture and our president is very committed to sustainability. Um, but I also think that it speaks to sort of the, the grassroots importance of, of this designation. So, um, You'll notice these are our sustainability goals. We recently updated them um, and we looked at incorporating things um, like a food reconnection goal. So encouraging to educate um, and empower people to understand where their food comes from and what implications that has both locally and globally. Um, we also have a uh, commitment to community success and that actually is um, really a goal around social equity. So how are we promoting social equity um, both on our campus with our students and staff and faculty, but then also um, in the way that we interact with our larger supply chain and the way that we interact with um, our kind of global community. Uh, so again, I think fair trade, um, it was kind of an easy yes for us because it fits in really well with the things that we've already committed to as a university. And when I was reaching out to our other partners and, and writing the briefings for our leadership, which I'll talk about, um, that was something I heavily relied on. And so I would say, look at things that you're already doing in your, in your organization um, that really already speak to the values of fair trade as well and use those to sort of bolster um, your your argument or your um, pitch to leadership if that's something that you need. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, again, so this just kind of highlights a couple of the new goals that we have. Um, and this, this excerpt here, ASU will enhance its local impact and social embeddedness. That's actually from our charter as a university. So before we had sustainability goals or anything like we started even talking about sustainability, that was already built into our charter. And so um, whenever, you know, we're trying to influence decisions in general with leadership, it's always good to refer to the charter, but this is a fair trade was an easy, easy win. We want to enhance local impact um, and social embeddedness on a global scale. We're not just um, a university that's in Arizona. We are far reaching. We're, um, we're, a global society and a global university. And so um, we really wanted to um, highlight how this fair trade designation helps us achieve our charter. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide uh, outlines the process, how we got to where we're at now, um, being the largest fair trade designated university in the country. Um, this all started with five students at ASU who um, connected with the fair trade campaigns um, in 2016. So um, it, like I said, this was really, really spurred on by students um, and their interest and their passion in this. And um, so that's kind of how this all got started. Um, then we had a student who was part of this initial fair trade um, initiative uh, who actually interned with our food service provider, Aramark, um, and their sole job, well, she, she was a sustainability graduate student, so she could have chosen a couple different ways to go uh, with uh, her internship with Aramark, um, but she interned with their sustainability department, and she was particularly interested in fair trade um, so that's something that um, Aramark really let her run with, and it was something that they had committed to doing on at, at other universities. So they they knew that it was um, they had the proof of concept that they could do it, um, and so they they really let her run with it. And so um, they started working with Aramark to source products and do engagement and do education across uh, the university to talk to people about fair trade um, and to sort of um, figure out getting our sourcing for all of our products in all of our many uh, dining establishments with five campuses. We have a lot of dining establishments. And so the students really did a lot of that like work in coordination with Airmark. So now here's when I get involved. <laughs> so the students um, before this, I will be completely honest with you, this was not even really on our radar as the sustainability department for the university. Um, Airmark had mentioned that aspirationally they, they wanted to move towards um, a fair trade designation um, and it was something they were working on, but we, we were not even aware of a, a lot of the stuff that was going on behind the scenes. And so um, the students drafted a resolution to the president's office asking our president, Michael Crow, to sign off um, and, and show our commitment, which is part of the fair trade um, designation components. And um, of course, the president was hesitant as he is with anything that comes across his desk. And he, so he sent it back to our office and just basically said, can you vet this? Can you reach out? Can you figure out what this movement is all about? And reach out to the partners um, who will be impacted with this to see how they feel about it. And so, you know, I initially, um, I was like, okay, I don't even know where to start with this, but we reached out to um, Aramark and our partners there, and they, they basically were like, oh yeah, we're already work on, working on this. Um, we're totally on board. It should be an easy thing for us to, to finish up and accomplish in terms of um, the sourcing. And the students really are leading the engagement and the education and the outreach to other departments um, that might be affected or might be able to... Um, might be interested in fair trade products and catering, um, et cetera. So we really got involved when the president's office um, reached back out to us and said, okay, um, we need you to just make sure all of the partners are on board. And so um, I connected with Kylie um, and I connected with our student group um, on campus and just kind of talked with them about the process they'd gone through. And um, then we, put together a letter, um, a briefing, and we asked all the partners to sign off on it, and they were happy to do so. Um, and I think that they, one, were really happy to do so because um, fair trade values are really in line with a lot of things we value um, at ASU, but also because the students had done a lot of the coordination and legwork and making sure that they were reaching out to the right partners. And so I, I think that's just another key takeaway is, 
um, if you know the key partners uh, that will be influential in making these things happen, reach out to them early and start the conversation early because I think that that was really what was a win for us that um, the president's office um, was really willing to sign off for it if, if we've already done our due diligence and our major campus partners are already advocates for us. So um, reach out early and kind of keep that process and that communication going um, as you move through the process. Um, our president signed the resolution and he actually issued a open letter to our entire community talking about why fair trade is important in alliance with our values. So again, that really helps build um, kind of a, a great culture around supporting this initiative. And we didn't ask him to do that, which was just great that he did it anyway. So um, if you have that leverage with your leadership and they can issue some kind of um, statement aligning with your values, I think that's very beneficial. Um, but uh, it was a, a nice surprise for us. Um, and then uh, we initially had all of our fair trade um, product requirements met. Um, so sourcing in all of our dining locations and in our retail locations, and then we were designated. Um, and so it was uh, about a two year process. Um, and again, I would say this was largely student led and also um, with buy-in from our partners. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, is Daniela and Sydney presenting um, a very large version of our fair trade designation certificate um, to our president, Michael Crow, who is on um, the left-hand side, and to our CFO, uh, Dr. Mo Morgan Olson, on the right-hand side. Um, and this was part of a state of sustainability event that we hosted on September 24th. And the whole goal was just to talk about where we're at as a university. And our fair trade designation was our kind of highlighted moment. And I will tell you, I've never planned an event in my five years at ASU with the president speaking at it and at anything this high level, but this was one of my favorite moments um, because the students actually got to present and shake President Crow's hand and he thanked them for all of their effort. And so I, I'm really, uh, really proud of this and we all are very proud of this as an institution. Um, and I tell um, the student groups and I still talk with Daniela and Sydney that whenever I work with student groups, I always hold them up kind of as the gold standard of how to do things right and how um, a couple students really can make a big initiative like this happen at the university level with um, good planning and communication with university partners. All right, uh, next slide. Um, so just a couple key takeaways um, that I think that I really learned from this process and um, that I plan to kind of apply to other university-wide initiatives. Um, I would say build solid program um, foundation before approaching leadership. So the way that it happened at ASU with um, us actually having a student intern with our um, dining provider and having students really drive the outreach and engagement to other students before the president's office ever even saw anything. I think that that was essential um, because then, you know, we can say to our leadership, uh, we've already looked into this. We're good to go. Um, no need to even um, we've done our due diligence, you just need to sign. And so um, that that made our lives easier and also um, just made everything run very smoothly. I also would say support open dialogue between your campus partners. Um, so just make sure that you're checking in with your um, service providers or your food providers and your retail um, to see if they have questions or need help with anything. I answered a question for one of our food service providers um, about fair trade and what the designation means and just having someone who's kind of that point person to ask any questions I think is really, really helpful in helping people make some changes um, and leverage student creativity and enthusiasm. This I can say would not have happened um, as soon as it did without our student leadership. This is absolutely, um, they were essential in the process. And then the last thing is that leadership and grassroots support are both crucial to success. So like I said, we value sustainability and we value social equity and human welfare um, at ASU. That's in our charter, it's in our goals, um, but we are such a large institution that um, we need kind of that grassroots support too and people to drive initiatives forward um, and to reach out to the right people to actually make things happen. So um, 
we're lucky to have both. All right. And, and that's, that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to take questions on kind of our process or how we interact with our partners, but um, thank you. I'm, I'm so happy um, to be able to present to you. Great. Thank you so much, Leslie. That was a wonderful, wonderful overview of all of the hard work that Arizona State University has done uh, the past couple of years to become now the largest fair trade university in the country. So congratulations again, and thank you for sharing your insights with us. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll have some time at the end, um, a good 15 minutes or so for questions after we hear from Aaron. So without further ado, let me introduce Aaron Fabris now. Aaron is the Sustainability Manager for UCLA Housing and Hospitality Services. As the Sustainability Manager for Housing and Hospitality Services at UCLA, Aaron Fabris is tasked with implementing, maintaining, and tracking the progress of sustainability programs for on and off campus housing. UCLA Guesthouse, Conferences and Catering, Vending Services, the Lake Arrowhead Conference Center, and the Luskin Conference Center. Aaron comes to UCLA with over four years of sustainability experience, most recently as the Sustainability Coordinator for the University of Southern California, where she created the Sustainability Program for Housing. Aaron holds a Bachelor's in Marine Biology and a Master's of Environmental Science and Management from UC Santa Barbara. As a student, Aaron studied ocean acidification and the environmental impact of the film industry. Thanks, Kylie. Um, hi, everybody. So thank you for attending again. My name is Erin, and I'm the Sustainability Manager for Housing and Hospitality at UCLA. Um, to give you sort of a background on UCLA housing, we have 14,000 students who live with us on campus, and we serve over 30,000 meals a day. Uh, so it's a pretty big operation. Uh, when UCLA became a fair trade university, we were the largest university to receive a fair trade designation at that time. That was in 2016. Um, and we're no longer the largest, but we're still the largest fair trade university in California. And the journey to becoming a fair trade university took about four years for us, but it's something that, that UCLA is really proud of and something we continue to promote on our campus. Um, so in this session, I'm, I'll talk about some of the steps it took for us to become a fair trade university and some of the key partnerships that we made along the way. So I want to briefly cover some of the steps to fair trade designation in case anyone's uh, unfamiliar with them because we pretty well followed these steps to become a fair trade university. Uh, so the first is to form a student team that should include four students and one non-student. The second is to source fair trade items in all campus owned and operated dining venues. Uh, that means that each of our dining venues needed to offer at least two fair trade products. The third step is to source fair trade at meetings and events. And then the final step is to commit to fair trade education by completing two educational activities each academic term. So these are sort of the steps that, that we took to receive our fair trade status. And so we'll go over each of them um, and explain what we did each stage. Next slide. So the first is to form a student team. So one thing that, that Leslie was mentioning a lot and another thing that's definitely true at UCLA and has been echoed by multiple departments at UCLA is that students really are the drivers of these efforts. So students are the ones that kicked off fair trade efforts at UCLA and they're the ones who kept all the other departments on task. Um, and the student group that really drove our efforts is called E3, Ecology, Economy and Equity. And they're the largest student environmental organization at UCLA. They also serve as sort of an incubator, so smaller student groups can start off within their organization until they become large enough to become their own independent student organization. But E3 started a fair trade campaign in 2012 when they started hosting events to educate students on what fair trade meant. So they started doing their own educational events and then in 2013, they strengthened those efforts by bringing a fair trade resolution to the undergraduate student government at UCLA. So our student government is called the Undergraduate Student Association Council, or USAC. So they went to USAC and explained that they wanted to become a fair trade university. So in April of 2013, USAC passed a resolution in favor of making UCLA a fair trade campus. And UCLA really does pride itself on listening to students' concerns. So passing this resolution was a really great way to get other stakeholders on board. Uh, next slide. So then the second step was to source fair trade in dining venues. So there are two groups 
on campus that oversee dining operations. That's Associated Students UCLA or AS UCLA, and then UCLA Housing Hospitality, which is my department. So AS UCLA oversees all of the retail dining operations. So they have 12 cafes, restaurants, and coffee shops across campus that they operate. And then Housing Hospitality oversees all of our residential dining. So that's four all-you-care-to-eat venues and four to-go venues. And these two groups, we operate pretty independently, so it's necessary to get stakeholders from both sides involved. One thing that really helped us um, in sourcing these products is our UC policy goal. So there's a UC goal of 20% sustainable spend by 2020, and fair trade is included in that sustainable spend. So any fair trade products that we purchase go towards our policy goal, um, and that holds true for both ASUCLA and Housing Hospitality. So that was helpful in trying to promote the purchasing of these products. Um, but if we start by looking at ASUCLA, they'd actually already been sourcing fair trade coffee since the late 90s. So for them, it was just a matter of making sure they were promoting another second product in all of their venues. Um, and so they ended up just buying more chocolate and sourcing fair trade sugar and tea in all of those ASUCLA locations. And it was pretty easy for them to get all those products. Um, getting everything at Housing and Hospitality took a little bit more time. So when students approached dining about sourcing fair trade coffee, dining was on board. So the sustainability position within Housing and Hospitality, my position is actually 10 years old, so it's as old as the sustainability office at UCLA. So there's definitely like um, culture and support for these types of efforts within this department. Um, so when students approached dining, people were on board, but UCLA was in a coffee contract and we didn't have any room to renegotiate. So there was a lot of interest and support, but the coffee contract prevented any further action. Um, but despite that, students kept their fair trade education going, um, kept the discussion going, um, and so it was, it was really kept in the forefront of people's minds. Uh, next slide. So then in 2016, the coffee contract was up for renegotiation. And because the students had continued to lobby for fair trade products and dining was paying attention to student concerns, um, in our RFP, we asked that coffee companies present a fair trade blend as the default option for all of our coffee. So when we sent out our RFP, we said you need to have fair trade. And so five companies submitted RFPs to UCLA, including Starbucks and Pete, but eventually we chose Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf. So before this proposal, Coffee Bean did not have a fair trade option, but as a result of UCLA's request for fair trade coffee, they actually created a blend specifically for UCLA, which was fair trade, and that was deemed the university blend. And it was created specifically for UCLA Housing Hospitality. Um, so because of our size and our buying power, because we serve 30,000 meals a day, um, we were able to create this product that didn't exist before. So that really indicates that the power that, that you have as a university um, to create real changes. Um, and in addition to, this was like the biggest step we needed to take within dining to get fair, fair trade, but we also added um, sugar and fair trade tea in our dining halls as well. Uh, next, next slide. So then our third step to becoming a fair trade university was getting fair trade products served at our events and meetings. So for us, this meant getting fair trade served in UCLA catering and UCLA coffee services, both of which are operated by Housing Hospitality. Um, one thing that's different about these two groups is they're, they're not included in our sustainable spend goal and our UC goal, so they don't have the same incentives that um, regular residential dining does to purchase these products. Um, so there is a little bit of pushback because those, these two groups weren't sure that there was going to be a market for these products. They thought they were just gonna sit on the shelf and never be ordered. So it did take some convincing. Um, what we had to do is convince them to just purchase everything in small quantities at first. Um, so they wouldn't have a lot of unsold inventory. And then once we could prove that, that there was a market for this, then they could start buying it in larger amounts. Um, so UCLA Catering came around, now they have Fair Trade Coffee as their default coffee, Coffee Services was on board, um, and two years later after we originally received our designation, um, they're still offering these Fair Trade products, so we demonstrated that there was a market for them and there was interest in our, in our guests for these products. 
Uh, next slide. And so then the last step um, was commitment to fair trade education. And again, this is largely, largely driven by students. Um, they table at different fairs and events. Um, they continually meet with stakeholders on our campuses, stakeholders within my department, stakeholders within ASUCLA, um, and push for better awareness of fair trade practices. So because of their involvement, we have signage in our dining halls indicating that our coffee is fair trade. Um, and we announced our fair trade, our original fair trade designation in 2016 at our annual Green Gala sustainability celebration. And we've made sure to continue to promote this at each successive Green Gala where we highlight our position as a fair trade university. We also mention it in all of our new employee onboarding sessions. Um, and so we really try to get the word out about being a fair trade university and um, increasing the awareness about this. But definitely one clear theme throughout this whole journey is that fair trade designation would not have been possible without the push from the students. Um, that's been echoed by others across the university. Um, and that was also what Leslie was saying. So they're really important in, in keeping this issue front and center for administrators and then continuing to educate students and advocate for further awareness about fair trade practices. Um, so we really had success through that student involvement, through some of our policies, um, top-down policies, and then it was just a matter of, of getting everybody on board um, to really get that designation. So that's, that's all I have for you. Um, and again, my name is Erin, and on the next slide, I think I have my contact information. So if anyone would like to reach out with specific questions, um, I'm happy to answer those and speak more about Fair Trade at UCLA. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Erin. That was a, a fantastic overview. So we have some time for Q&A now. Um, so if anyone has a question either for Leslie and the work that Arizona State University um, sustainability practices in partnership with um, dining services and the student group there has done or a question for Erin and the UCLA campaign, um, please feel free to take yourself off mute and ask either of them a question. I actually have a question for um, both speakers, because um, since both of these universities are fair trade designated, I was wondering how you're keeping people involved and keeping people aware now that you're not actively working towards the designation goals. Um, so I can start. I think that that's really driven by our students. So we have um, like two fair trade ambassador students who are um, working on these fair trade efforts. And so they have things that they're trying to see like increased signage, um, increased awareness. And so they make sure to meet with me and others within my department every quarter um, to ask for what, what they're looking for. And then we try to work with them to, to meet their needs and continue to promote um, these efforts. Um, and I, I'll, just talk a little bit, this Leslie, talk a little bit about what ASU is doing. Um, so uh, we also have fair trade ambassadors and Daniela, I think is on a fair trade leadership board, which Kylie can speak to a little bit to stay connected with um, fair trade campaigns. Um, but uh, our students that haven't graduated yet that were involved in this initiative um, actually decided to form a formal student organization um, so that they could organize and recruit other students to be involved in this initiative. And as part of being a formal organization, they also get funding from our student government. And so um, that's a way to kind of sustain their efforts. Um, and they asked me to be their advisor, which was really great. Um, Cause all of our student orgs as typical for most universities need a staff advisor. And so I'm their advisor, which is great because then, you know, I have a connection into um, our, uh, partners, our dining service partners, and I can help them kind of navigate um, some of the many layers of bureaucracy that can exist at a big place like ASU. Um, so I think kind of organizing and, and creating a formal organization structure has been helpful for our students in particular. Um, and that way, um, you know, as Aaron was talking about, they can kind of collectively um, ask for better signage or come up with campaigns or identify areas where we might expand um, our fair trade offerings.
Thanks, that's a really good question. And just to note, in follow-up to this call, we will be sharing out some resources around some of the questions that we um, have for, for Aaron and Leslie, one of which is our sustainable leadership guide. So we do have some resources from fair trade campaigns on how to keep student leaders involved, um, you know, how to maintain momentum post-designation. Great, um, anyone else have a question for either Aaron or Leslie? I do, if that's okay. Hi, everybody. This is this is Azade. Um, I was a little bit curious and would love to hear Leslie elabor elaborate a little bit further on how you came up with the program before you reached out to your influencers to convince them to guide you guys or help you guys. Sure. Um, I will. I will elaborate as much as I can. Um, like I said, it was largely. Um, driven and coordinated by our student groups um, before we even got involved. And so they um, really worked on um, working with Kylie's team and um, getting the resources from Fair Trade Campaign. Um, and I know that there's just a wealth of resources um, that the Fair Trade Campaigns offer. And so our students really worked and, and, and started that way. Um, and then um, they connected with our food service provider. And like I said, we did have a student who actually interned with Aramark. Um, and she basically voiced that this was something that she was interested in. And it was something that Aramark was also interested in for our campus. Um, so I think that that was really helpful and maybe just, you know, lucky timing too. Um, but I think for, for me and when I think about how this designation was successful, um, for me it was always communicating um, that the values of the fair trade campaigns really align with the values of our institution. And so I think um, the more that you can kind of use that uh, when you reach out to la leadership to say, you know, this is how we um, walk the talk uh, and this is how uh, this Kind of helps with our broader goals. Um, I think that that was really influential and you know we started with that pitch and then when our leadership talks about the designation now um, that's always what they refer to is that it always it makes sense for ASU because this is something um, that we value for these reasons. Um, so uh, yeah I, I think just kind of finding ways um, in your communications um, to align with the values you might already have. Right. Thank you for that. And I do have another follow up question to that. So I guess I'm just trying to imagine if I went to, um, I don't know, let's say Santa Monica College here down the street from me and we're trying to turn them to a fair trade entity. Um, and I want to convince the president to get on board with that. I'm visualizing that I would go to him with kind of like a business plan, basically, with those values communicated through, you know, what mm -hmm. I'm going to present at the right direction. I'm used to doing business stuff, but I'm not used to doing things on campus and or for fair trade. So I'm just trying to see how I should navigate my own mind. Mm -hmm. if anything. Yeah, sure. So I, th I think, yes, having in the business plan how um, fair trade aligns with the goals that Santa Monica might already have um, is helpful. But I also would encourage you to um, reach out to the stakeholders that would be most impacted or impactful in that designation before you even go to the president's office. So sure, that's, sure. that's what happens at ASU. If things are gonna get done at ASU, um, our president and our CFO, because we basically operate like a city, we're the size of some cities, um, they wanna know that all the partners are already on board. And so I would assume that that's probably similar, similar at a lot of institutions. And so if you can identify some key stakeholders or you already have champions there, I would reach out to them um, and ask them to kind of help support your, your outreach to the president. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Anyone else have a question for Leslie or for Aaron? And remember, if you're on mute, we can't hear you. You have to take yourself off mute in the bottom uh, left-hand corner. Hi, I have a question. Um, Go for it. My name is Zach, and I'm from the University of Iowa in Iowa City, and I'm um, currently just in the beginning stages of getting my group started. Um, I also am doing the same route that Leslie was talking about at ASU with forming a um, like official student group on campus. Um, I actually just got an email today that our 
constitution was approved, so that's officially a fair trade at Iowa is now a group now, so that's pretty cool. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, so as far as getting the steering committee built, um, what do you suggest the roles be of the people on the steering committee? Whether they'd be like, I've been trying to come up with some ideas and I wanna make sure that I'm doing it in a way that's um, the most efficient and the most impactful. If any, so if anybody has any tips on like what roles each person on the steering committee um, take on, that would be super helpful. Do you mean roles in terms of students within the group? Yeah, as far as the student committee members, because I know there's some resources that I looked at that kind of hinted that, but I didn't know if you guys had any other suggestions or anything else like that. If not, that's totally okay too. <laughs> I, have, I have a suggestion that um, is probably just more generalized for student initiatives, <laughs> but, but maybe worth noting. Um, so I would say, and what I have been working with um, our students who started this fair trade designation is when you look at the students that are on your steering committee or your leadership board, make sure that you have a plan uh, for leadership succession and that you are continuing to try to bring people into the fold and bring students into the fold. And I, I, Aaron touched on this, that, um, you know, students are essential in keeping this thing alive and, and keeping it moving forward. And so I think just being really thoughtful um, in how you're bringing other students on board um, and getting them involved at every level, but particularly to move into leadership positions, because that's what happens with a lot of student dri driven initiatives, unfortunately, um, is that, you know, they're, they're great for a couple of years and then um, all of the students who are in leadership positions graduate and then um, you know a department has to own it and that department might not even have the historical knowledge to really carry it through and so that's something that um, I've been working with our group at ASU on it's just they're uh, mostly juniors and seniors and they're about to graduate is um, how are you going to make this work lasting beyond um, your time here and you know maybe that's looking at departments that you partner with um, and how you're recruiting people to, to come along with you um, after you get your designation. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo what, what Leslie said. And, and like with our, with students on our campus, they work a lot with like our largest environmental student org. Um, and that's such a, a big group and it's been around for like a long enough time. I'm not concerned that that group is gonna lose student leadership and lose momentum. So by also having that relationship with that pretty well-established student group that helps to maintain these efforts and make sure that people um, don't graduate and then have a lot of progress get lost. And Zach, to your question um, around roles, um, you know, I will say that, you know, working with so many of our different campuses across the country, there's so many different structures um, to how you can form a committee and the roles um, involved. And so I know there's folks on this call that have uh, experience with more structured formal committees. So in the way of executive boards, for example, where we will have a president and a vice president, a treasurer, a secretary, um, dining liaisons, an outreach lead, that's very much so how the ASU Arizona State University Fair Trade Student Group is structured um, and I know that there's actually been campaigns UCLA is one of them their student group during the time of the the designation that have um, adopted an application of sorts um, for committee members you know really kind of putting a call out for folks to join and those are pieces that I'm happy to, to share with you as, as well as other folks on the call and the follow-up but I think that that really creates um, not only a sense of accountability but also, um, you know, leads members to think about what roles might be the best fit for them on the committee. You know, are you really, um, you know, passionate about and skilled in social media, in marketing and communications, or are you more of um, an expert in, in research or, you know, data entry, and so you want to help with the, the outlet mapping? So there's definitely been a lot of different ways it's been set up, but certainly I think that structure um, can provide a lot of value to a fair trade committee on campus. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think we have a couple more questions. Um, anyone else have something else they want to bring to either Leslie or Aaron? Uh, 
Uh, I'll go ahead with a question for Aaron. Uh, this is Bradley. Uh, I'm a graduate of University of Dayton, uh, Fair Trade University, and I was really interested to hear you talk about uh, the coffee contract that you set up at UCLA and wondered if you could talk more about that process. Um, I know you said five uh, companies submitted RFPs, but could you say more about what those companies' reactions were? And then I think you said the one you went with uh, didn't have a fair trade blend before. So what was it like uh, working through that process with them um, to get them to have a fair trade blend? Yeah, so I wasn't directly involved in that RFP process because I came on board a little bit later, but I can share with you um, what I know about that process. So UCLA is really large and our dining operation is really large. So companies are very eager to, to be in business with UCLA. Um, so if we come out and we say like, hey, we want fair trade blend, like everyone's going to do their best to um, align with, with what we're looking for. Um, and so a lot, and a lot of those other groups already had fair trade blends, but like I said, like, even though Coffee Bean did not have one, they were willing to create one just for the sake of getting UCLA's business. Um, and now um, we do have that and we source it in, in all of our different venues. Um, and then so after we, they can show us that they have the products that we're looking for, for us it just comes down um, to cost. So we want to make sure that we're hitting a price point that works for us and that will work um, for like our students and for our dining plan. Um, so I'm not sure if that totally answers your question. I, if you have further questions, I can like look back and see if I can find some more information that might be more helpful to you. Um, that's that's helpful to, to hear, I guess, just the purchasing power of UCLA and many universities, which is important to use. Um, do you know if did UCLA then, did you have to work uh, Coffee Bean through the process about what fair trade was, or is that something that they really went on their own and put in all the, the research to figure out? Um, I would, I don't know this for sure, but I would say that that was something they did on their own since I think fair trade is a pretty um, well known practice in the coffee space. So, um, I, I think that they just went ahead and, and did that on their own. Okay, thank you. Then let's go ahead and, and wrap up here. We just have a couple announcements um, from Fairtrade Canada. Campaigns. So the first is that, as we mentioned, this is part of a uh, Fair Trade Month webinar series that we are hosting. So for the remainder of October, we will have two more webinars that we're hosting on Fair Trade. Uh, October 15th, this coming Monday, um, Fair Trade and the Sustainable Development Goals and how Fair Trade can play a role in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And then October 23rd, we have Telling Authentic Fair Trade stories. So please do join us for both of those and everyone that was on the webinar today will receive um, some information and a link to register for both of those and please share them with your committee. The more the merrier. And last but not least, uh, Fair Trade Campaigns is hosting a 2019 national conference. We are so excited to convene um, all of our Fair Trade advocates from around the country in Chicago. It'll be March 1st through the 3rd of 2019, so coming up fairly quick here. And in particular, there's a campus partnership program that we're running for the conference that I want to make sure everyone on this call knows about. So I will send more information about that in follow-up if you registered for this call. Um, but it's a program where we're recognizing any campus that's able to um, fund uh, attendance for three or more students or staff at the conference. So we really hope that that will help drive student and staff campus attendees, but also be a nice way for us to recognize all of our fair trade campuses that are doing such great work. Work, um, and really committing to um, having their their students and staff at the conference so all of that to come and unless anyone has any final questions we will wrap up there and again thank you so much to Leslie and to Aaron for all of your insights it was really wonderful to, to have you both share all the great work that's been happening on your campuses <laughs>